I take refuge until I have awakened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the merit I create by listening to the Dharma, I will attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I have awakened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the merit I create by listening to the Dharma, I will attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I have awakened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the merit I create by listening to the Dharma, I will attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient. May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and its causes. May all sentient beings not be separated from sorrowless bliss. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free of bias, attachment, and anger. So that's it. Let's have a few minutes of silent meditation, observing your breath so that your mind can calm down and be free of extraneous thoughts and distractions. So let's do a short meditation like this. And since we'll be listening and talking about the Buddha's teachings this evening, then we should have the same motivation as the Buddha. <clears throat> In other words, we're not here uh, 
just to have a good time. Although we may, I hope we'll have a good time. Um, we're not here to gain information so that we can uh, talk to other people and pretend that we're very knowledgeable. But we want to have a motivation similar to the Buddha's motivation. So why did the Buddha do everything he did? from the beginning of the path all the way up to Buddhahood and then after he became a Buddha. His constant motivation was compassion. And it was with compassion <clears throat> that he freed his mind from all defilements and with compassion that he taught for 45 years to all sorts of people without discriminating against them or favoring others. So take a minute and cultivate that, a similar moment, uh, motivation of compassion for all beings. Because the more we can make our minds like the Buddha's minds, then the more when we hear the teachings, the teachings go into our hearts. So our motivation for sitting together this evening and sharing the Dharma yeah, should be a really extraordinary motivation, not just an ordinary one. And so that's why we think about and try and generate a mind of compassion for each and every living being. So this is quite different than our ordinary mind. Our ordinary mind, I like these people, I'll do good things for them. I can't stand those people, I'll take revenge if I can. And then in the middle, the strangers that we don't know, that we usually just ignore. So the Buddha didn't have that kind of attitude towards living beings. He saw everybody equally because everybody equally wanted happiness and equally wanted to be free of suffering. So he didn't judge people according to their intelligence or their socioeconomic class or their status in society or their wealth or their fame, or their athletic, artistic, or musical ability. I think we can turn that light off. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. But the Buddha's heart was open towards everybody. Yeah. So, if somebody invited him to teach, uh, 
no matter who it was, as long as their invitation was coming from a sincere mind, he went. Yeah. Even they were lepers, even who knows what. Okay. So this is a very good role model for us because we really have a lot of partiality and judgment towards other living beings. I like this one because they're nice to me. I don't like that one because they insult me. Yeah, This is what's going on in our mind all day long. We have the tremendous potential to become a fully awakened Buddha. Incredible potential in our in our minds. And how do we use it? To say, I like this, give it to me. I don't like that, get it away from me. You know, so petty. The things we like, the things we don't like, all those things are changing every single moment. None of them are remaining static at all. And yet, we're so obsessed with them. You know, oh, there's something beautiful. Wow, look at this watch with the pink frame. Isn't that beautiful? It reminds me of Barbie. <laughs> and I think Barbie is fantastic. Yeah. I want to be like Barbie. Hmm? I don't want to be like Barbie. But this is an example of how our mind works, isn't it? We see something that has a little bit of glitter and we want to possess it, we want to be like it, we want to associate with it. And even if at the end of this evening I separate from it, still, right now, clutch, cling. Yeah? And then when I separate it from it, because I find out that it's somebody else's, even though I know right now it's somebody else's, I'm kind of thinking maybe they'll give it to me. Yeah, because they know I like Barbie. Yeah, but they take it back. And then I'm lost, I'm devastated, I'm so disappointed. Yeah, because this represented to me success. Yeah. So this is just something like this. But what about your car? Does your car represent success to you? Do you have a nice, shiny car? You know? Maybe a BMW, a Lexus, yeah, that you really hope that other people see and that they know that it's yours. And we feel successful then. Yeah. Actually, why are we feeling successful over a pile of junk metal? Because that's really what your BMW is. It may not be junk mail at this uh, junk metal at this moment. But just wait a few years, or maybe tomorrow, somebody will smash into it. Yeah. But we just give it so much meaning. I want it. Yeah. And then we see a person yeah, who looks at us like this and says, you fool, you jerk, we work together as a team at the office on a project and you were supposed to lead us but you disappeared. But 
So we did all the work. And then at the end, you came back, and when the boss came, you took all the credit. Oh, we don't like you. Yeah. Uh, we want to retaliate. And all these other people, you know, we're on the team who made it happen. So all my friends, we are all together, and we can't stand you. Yeah. We don't care who in this world thinks you're wonderful. We know you're not. Yeah, we get all wrapped up in planning how to take our revenge on this person who insulted us. Yeah, how to maybe embarrass him in front of a whole group of people. That's good revenge, isn't it? Yeah, embarrass somebody in front of a group of people. So we think about how to do that. And this is how we spend our time, at, although we have a precious human life, with all the necessary qualities so that we can encounter the Dharma, and study it, and have teachers, and have friends to practice it with. Yeah, but how do we use our life? Planning revenge. Yeah. Shantideva, in his, uh, he's an 8th century Indian sage, and he wrote a book called Engaging in the Bodhisattva's Deeds. And he said, why do you want to take revenge if these people are going to die all by themselves? Yeah? It's a good point, isn't it? You know, everybody's in permanent. We're all going to die. So what's the use of taking revenge and wishing somebody to be dead? Just wait a little time. <laughs> yeah? But what kind of people are we if we want, if we wish that other people die? Yeah. Or that we wish that somebody gets thrown under the bus? Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's hard to live with if we have that kind of mind. Okay? So what I'm getting at is the importance of monitoring our mind. You know, having a good intention about how we want to uh, use our mind, how we want to use our time, and then checking up, yeah, and monitoring our mind and seeing if we're still doing what we have the aspiration to do. So there are two mental factors here. One is mindfulness, sati, yeah, so you have an idea of the kind of person you want to be, how you want to speak to people, what your values are, what your pre precepts are, how you want to talk to them. Yeah, and so you live and you try and keep this in mind. The mindfulness is to keep your mind on that. And then there's another mental factor, samprajana, which uh, I like to translate as introspective awareness. So it's a, it's a mind, or a mental factor, actually, that monitors our mind. You know, I, I want to, uh, to treat everybody fairly, without prejudice. And you watch your mind during the day. And do you do that? Or when there's people you like, are you like so wonderfully kind and sweet? And to people you don't like, meh. Okay, so you have to watch your mind. And if it goes off what you want it to pay attention to, then you need to bring it back. Okay, so this is where 
disconnect to connect comes in. Yeah. I discovered that whatever I talk about, I have to say the title of the talk once. Then people feel satisfied that they got what they wanted. But if I talk, even if I talk about the topic, but I don't say the title, then they're very disappointed. Yeah. I came here to hear about disconnect to connect. Yeah. Okay, so what do we have to disconnect from? Yeah. And what do we have to connect to? What we have to disconnect from is ignorance, anger, and clinging attachment and all the other afflictions. Yeah. Pride, arrogance, jealousy, envy, lack of integrity, lack of consideration for others, laziness, forgetfulness. Buddha taught 84,000 of these things that we have to disconnect from. So we have a little bit of work ahead of us. Okay, we don't have to do it one by one. Okay, we, it's good to pick the ones that really trouble you the most in your life. Yeah. And, uh, and really work, you know, on those and disconnecting from them. So to disconnect from these mental afflictions, we have to know the antidotes to them. Okay? We have to know the right way to look at something, yeah? the virtuous way to look at something, so that we don't impute all of our wrong conceptions on top of things and on top of people. Okay. So it sounds good. Oh yeah, the afflictions. Those are, yeah, mental states that uh, make our mind disturbed, that make us do things that we don't feel good about. Yes, I want to get rid of my afflictions. But then, when we hear what it is that, you know, the afflictions we should get rid of, we go. Oh, but I actually like those states. <laughs> yeah? Like attachment. Yeah? Yeah? I think most of you know the Dharma pretty well already. Attachment. The mind that projects uh, good qualities onto someone or something and then wants to possess it. And we like it. One part of our mind likes attachment. When we can get what we want, attachment is great. Yeah, because attachment wants, it's a sticky mind. It's like bubble gum. Yeah, I want this. Okay, I want it, I want it, I want it. I've got to get it, and once I get it, I don't want to separate from it, ever, ever, ever. Yeah, and now I have it. I'm in heaven. Yeah. Look when you fall in love. Yeah? Falling in love is a very good example of attachment. Because yeah. the person you fall in love with, you project everything wonderful on that person. Yeah. They're just so unimaginably wonderful. No mistakes, yeah? How are they wonderful? Well, they think I'm the best person they've ever met. Matt, that's what makes them wonderful, is they like me and they praise me and they give me presents and they tell me how wonderful I am and how they can't live without me. And they say, your eyes are like diamonds, your teeth are like pearls. And I feel so beautiful. 
beautiful. And they sing that to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's like to fall in love, huh? Some of you know what I talk about, and some of you are going, what in the world? This lady is nutty. But think about your experience. Yeah. So the attachment makes us feel good when we get what we want. But because everything that comes together must separate, and we have no choice but to separate, and we don't know when we're going to separate, then when the separation comes, which is always at a time we don't want it to come, then we cry. We either cry, I lost my object of attachment, uh, or we get mad at who took us, took it away from us. Yeah? Oh, somebody else looked at my Prince Charming. Yeah. You can't look at him. He's mine. Yeah. And then you get married. And you live happily ever after for a, a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and then reality sets in, you know? And this person who was so wonderful, now he doesn't clean up after himself. He expects you to, yeah. He, he drives in a way that you can't stand. Have you ever been in a car with somebody who has one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake at the same time? Yeah? So they press the gas, then they press the brake, then they press the gas, then, the <laughs> then the gas. So you're sitting in the seat going... <laughs> and wait a minute, Prince Charming, you know, our... our you don't know how to drive. Is it because you always rode a white horse? <laughs> you don't know how to drive properly? Oh my goodness, what happened to you, Prince Charming? Yeah? You were so good looking when I met you, and now you have gray hair just like me, but I still look beautiful. <laughs> yeah? It's like that, isn't it? And then you find out he gets in a bad mood. You know, sometimes he wakes up, he's in a foul mood. And when he comes home from work, he just plops himself down and says, cook dinner for me. <laughs> Who do you think you are, buddy? Yeah, you cook dinner for me. That's what you said you'd do when we were courting. And now you're a hypocrite. You're, uh, yeah, because, you know, he promised all sorts of things Yeah, when you were dating, didn't he? Promised all sorts of things. And now... <laughs> okay, so, with attachment, we don't want to give it up when we have our object of attachment, but when we're separated from it, then we're totally miserable. Yeah. So it would actually be good for our own well-being to give up attachment and not get so excited about the things that glitter and not get so despondent when we separate from them or when the glitter goes away, yeah, to have a more balanced, even mind. Okay. So I say that, then somebody's going to raise their hand and say, but if you always have a balanced, easy mind and you don't have the ups of feeling, 
wonderful when you get what you want and feeling depressed when you don't get what you want. If you don't have this up and down, then you're not really experiencing life. Your life is just flat and boring. <laughs> really, so many people say that. Yeah. If I get rid of attachment, my life will be so boring. Yeah. So it's worth, the suffering is worth it to have those moments when, oh, I'm like this. But check up, it, are you really happy then? And when your mind is overwhelmed by attachment, what kind of karma are you creating? Yeah, because what do we do under the influence of attachment? Well, we lie. We lie to get what we want. Do you lie? Two. Okay, maybe four people lie. Yeah, three of them are the Sangha. <laughs> But they're the honest ones who aren't afraid to say, I have faults. Yeah. The people who don't want to say, I have faults, have really big faults because they can't admit their mistakes. Yeah. They always want to paint everything over so that they look good. Okay, so we lie to get what we want, we backbite, we talk behind people's back to get what we want, we sit around and covet things that other people possess with our mind, you know, just daydreaming, ah, oh, about, oh, I want this, I want that. I went to my friend's house. They have such an amazing, gorgeous Buddha statue. You can't have craving for a Buddha statue. I don't have attachment. Yeah. But wow, if I had that big, beautiful stat Buddha statue, then all my Buddhist friends would be jealous. Mm. Mm. I want that statue. Yeah. And you know what I really want? I want a picture of me together with my teacher that my teacher signed with my name on it. Two children with love from, you know, the name of your teacher. Yeah. Look. I am the most treasured disciple. Yeah, you want to see my picture? <laughs> this is me with Rinpoche or, or Sayada. This is me and Sayada. Yeah, me and Achan. And see, he even wrote his name and my name on it. <laughs> yeah, aren't I wonderful? So, we lie, we backbite, we steal. We steal to get what we want. Except, I know you people don't steal. Yeah, yeah, I know. You're all Buddhists. You're, you're, you don't steal. But, you know, your boss doesn't pay you enough. So, it's okay to take office supplies and different things from your workplace because your boss should actually pay you more and they don't so you're just taking actually you're not stealing it's stuff that is really yours your boss just hasn't given it to you yet okay yeah so we steal 
we can sometimes people kill to get what they want. Yeah, look at what Putin's doing. He wants to get land that belongs to Ukraine. So what does he do? He sits because he's smart. He's not going to go kill. He's going to stay in his nice plush office. Have you seen Putin's office when he talks to people? There's a huge long table. Yeah, like from here to there. He sits at one end and all of his ministers and generals are at the other end. Yeah, with a big space between. Yeah. Okay. So and he wants to be the, you know, reassemble the Russian Empire from the 19th century. Yeah, talk about being old fashioned. Yeah. He wants to retake all that land that used to belong to Russia, make it Russian again. So if he has to kill a, a few people, no problem. But he's not killing. He sends other people to do the work, dirty work for him. Yeah. And so how many lives have been lost in the war? between Russia and Ukraine? I don't think we even have an accurate toll of it. But so many lives. Yeah. People who have potential. Did you know that there's Buddhists in Ukraine and Buddhists in Russia? Did you know that? Yeah, I've been to Russia to teach a few times. People really sincere want to learn the Dharma. We have one friend in Ukraine, uh, and she didn't leave when the bombing started. She is such a good practitioner because everything that happens, she, she looks at it through the eyes of Dharma, and she's able to transform all that adversity into her dharma practice. Yeah, quite an amazing person. Okay. So, but to get what we want, we create all sorts of negative karma. Yeah. Who experiences the result of our negative karma? We do. And if you're the leader like Putin, even though Putin may not have killed anybody himself, because all the killing was done under his order, he accumulates the karma of every single person who killed somebody in that war. Yeah. What kind of rebirth do you think Putin is going to have? Yeah. Really horrible rebirth so horrible that we have to have compassion for him. Yeah, the mind is completely ignorant, knowing nothing about karma, not being able to distinguish virtue from non-virtue, and so doing whatever will satisfy his desires of this life. And after death, karma runs the show. Yeah. Okay, so maybe it's good to work on our mind to give up attachment. What are the antidotes to, to attachment? Well, how should we think in order to lessen our attachment to somebody? Well, first, or something, somebody or something. First of all, yeah, what I just was describing, run the whole movie in your mind of what it's going to be like and see that there's going to be separation or things will break or they will disappoint you, they won't be as good as you thought they were going to be. Yeah. 
So it, it play it out in your mind. I find that this very useful, you know, to to really think, okay, there's this beautiful thing that I, thing that I want, yeah, and then I imagine getting it, and then, you know, anything nice that you get, it's gonna get old, isn't it? And it's gonna <laughs> go out of style. So your nice expensive car will go, you know, after a few years you have to trade it in and get a new one. And it'll get dented. Yeah. And then you put your kids in the car. What are little kids going to do in the car? Yeah, They're going to jump all over. And they'll probably throw up too. And if you have a baby, you know, They'll pee all over your new car. Okay? So if you play it out in your mind like that, you realize, you know, there's really nothing there that's going to make me happy, that I can depend on to make me happy. Yeah? Because when we, have, we see an object and we project beauty on it, you know, or we project good qualities, it doesn't, it appears to our mind of attachment as if the goodness is coming from its side, independent of our mind. But when we look closely, yeah, the beauty that we're seeing is projected by our mind. Because if the beauty was really on the side of the object, then everybody would like what we like. Because the beauty's there and it would come into everybody's eyes. But some of the things I think are wonderful that I'm attached to, other people go, Bleh! you know? They don't like it all. Okay, so that in and of itself shows that the beauty is not in, and the goodness is not in the object. It's my mind projecting that. Okay? So when I have attachment, the object I'm seeing that I'm so attached to is not real. It's something made up by my mind. Okay, my mind makes it permanent, it's not going to change. My mind it makes it beautiful, it's not ugly in any way. My mind makes it delightful, pleasant, it has happiness in it. Yeah. No, it doesn't. And my mind makes it real, it has a real essence. So, uh, these are called the four distortions. Yeah. I think in Theravada, you, uh, yeah, it's, it's in the Theravada system too. Okay? So, you meditate on impermanence, on things having the nature of dukkha, being unsatisfactory, and on selflessness. So those, those three are very, very good antidotes when you have attachment. Yeah. But it's, it's also that other thing that I suggested, make a movie in your mind of how delightful it's going to be. You finally got this incredible car, you know, and you drive it home and your mom and dad are so happy. Look, my son, my daughter drives this expensive car. You know, and now finally your parents praise you more than they praise your siblings because you are now a success. You have that expensive car. Yeah. So you feel very proud of yourself. That's the first scene in the movie you're running. 
second scene is, yeah, you're driving the car, you park it, you come back to get in it, and the whole side of the car is scratched. Because somebody else was trying to park there, and it was clearly somebody like me when I was 16, <laughs> trying to park a car. Yeah. So, okay, it's a little scratched, you know. You drive it some more. Well, no, you don't drive it some more. You drive it to the shop. You get it fixed so that now it is a bright red color. Yeah. You know, you want a bright red expensive car. Yeah. Don't you? Yeah, you, you want maroon. I'm sorry, not bright red. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> so, uh, you know, then you're driving your maroon car after you had it fixed, you know, and then somebody rear ends you. Yeah, you're, you're at a light, and some driver, you know, behind you, this one isn't 16, this one is 85. <laughs> <laughs> and they drive, and boom! And you're like, whoa, what happened? And you get out, and there's Grandpa, you know? And he says, oh dear. I think I made a little dent in your car. Yeah? That's if Grandpa stays around. Some drivers disappear. They hit and they go. Yeah? So you don't know who hit your beautiful car. But you do know that they, that they drove a bright green car because now their paint is on the back of your fender. <laughs> fender. 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 Yeah. Yeah. The back of your car. Yeah. So it's bright green now. <laughs> so, you know, we play the movie out. And like, are you ever going to derive lasting, ultimate joy? from this compilation of metal, because that's all it is, it's a bunch of metal. And maybe, maybe you have leather seats. That makes it really expensive. It also makes it very uncomfortable if the sun's been shining on it. Um, or maybe you have plastic seats. Yeah. But it all is going to fall apart and be in the junkyard one day. So what's there to be attached to? Hmm? I had a friend who, uh, one, actually he was a student in one of the Dharma classes, and he was a doctor. And doctors in the States uh, have the reputation of being quite wealthy, and so they have very, very nice cars. But he, wrote, he drove some old car. I don't, I don't know the model because I cannot tell one car, the make of a car, one from another. You know, I can tell the color. But, you know, a Volkswagen from a Lexus, I can't tell you the difference. Okay, I'm sure you can. Anyway, so he, he you know, uh, he didn't have a, a, an expensive car, but he was supposed to because he had the image of being a doctor. Yeah? And I, but he was totally okay with it. He was totally okay with not having an expensive car. Yeah? I thought, that's oh, smart. Mm -hmm. Because it's very interesting 
you probably have noticed that when you have a certain occupation, yeah, then you have to drive a certain kind of car, your spouse has to look a certain kind of way, yeah, look who Donald Trump marries, yeah, look at the, he, you know, he wanted the image of being this big, rich, billionaire playboy, and so he married models. Yeah. Do you think Melanie Trump, uh, Melania Trump looks happy? Have you seen pictures of her? Yeah. She doesn't look happy at all. I've noticed that models often don't look happy. <laughs> Yeah, even they're not married to Donnie. <laughs> yeah. But you know when you drive when you walk through the um the section of the airport, you know, the what a duty free section, and they have all these pictures of models, you know, look looking at, you know, kind of they all take Ricola drops. <laughs> <laughs> And they, they all look like they're pouting, you know? They don't look happy. <laughs> oh. Yeah, they don't look happy. So poor Melania, you know? I mean, she's married to this guy because, you know, he fits her image and she fits him in image. So I guess you say that was a match made in heaven. <laughs> I don't want to go to heaven if that's what happens there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, can you imagine being married to Donnie? Oh, goodness. Anyway, back to the topic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you have to have a, your spouse has to look a certain way, you have to have a certain kind of car, your clothes, you have to dress according to your social status and according to your career. Yeah, you can't wear blue jeans. Yeah, unless they are so skin tight that you can't bend your leg. Then maybe you could wear them. But, you know, and your house has to be a certain way with certain kind of furniture. And your children, yeah, they have to fit your image too. And if your kids don't fit your image, oh boy. Yeah, then you, you got to do something with those kids. Yeah. Because your kids are supposed to be perfect. After all, they're going to go to, go to Harvard, aren't they? Yeah. Or maybe Yale. I think Harvard has more better status until last week. <laughs> then they had some problems. Okay. But Yale is where George Bush graduated from. That doesn't have much status in my mind. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so everything, you create an image of who, you, you know, ex you, you create this image of somebody who you are not, that you want to be, who has all the external accoutrements of somebody who fulfills that image. And you try and be that. Yeah, with your car and your spouse and your, you know, your business card, which is no longer this big, but it is this big. <laughs> yeah, with everything you are, on it, uh, and so you get all the accoutrements, 
and then you think, I am that kind of person. Inside, do you really believe it? Do you really think you're that kind of person? Yeah? If Donnie thought, Donnie's my nickname for him. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If Donnie really thought he was this rich, you know, successful business person who was, you know, going to be the leader of the world, why does he talk the way he talks? Yeah? Why does he act the way he acts? If he really had self-confidence that he was a successful person, why does he need to badmouth other people? Yeah? If we really have self-confidence, why do we need to create criticize other people and put them down to show that we're better. Yeah? If we really have good qualities and we're confident in them, not arrogant, but confident, yeah, then we don't need to show off to anybody. This is reminding me of a conversation I had with the incarnation of one of my uh, precious teachers. Yeah. It's interesting in the Tibetan system, you know, when you first meet an excellent teacher, sometimes they're quite old, he was already, he must have been in his 80s. Then they pass away, then they get reborn, then you know them when they're young. So first you know them when they're old, then you know them when they're young. Anyway, so I was talking with the young one, and, uh, and he was talking, he was saying, if I'm a good cook, I don't need to go around and tell the whole world how, what a good cook I am. All I need to do is cook a meal, and then people can see for themselves. You know? So if we really have confidence in ourselves, we don't have any need to go around and boast to other people or criticize people or whatever. Yeah? Because if we have those qualities, people will see them. We don't become proud of those qualities because there's nothing mine about our good qualities. We might think, my artistic ability, my business, co uh, you know, acute, uh, ac what, uh, ac acumen. acumen, that's it. Yeah. You never believed that my native language was English, would you? <laughs> yeah? So, you know, if you really have those qualities, you don't need to tell other people. You don't need to boast about it, because you don't need other people to think you're wonderful, because you have your own confidence. Yeah? So your life is actually much more relaxed. Yeah? So when I see people who are very arrogant, I immediately know they don't have self-confidence. When I see people who are humble, then I know they have self-confidence. One time, I think this was in 1989, right, right about the time when the Dalai Lama uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize, and he was in uh, California speaking at some kind of conference. So the conference, uh, you know, was thousands of people at the conference, 
and he was on the panel. It was quite a big panel with all these experts. I don't know what the experts were experts in, but they were experts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and if somebody's an expert, So somebody in the audience raised their hand and asked a question, you know, uh, to the Dalai Lama. And His Holiness looked at that. He looked and he he paused for a minute, and then he said, "I don't know." And the entire audience was silent. The expert of the panel of experts said, I don't know. (sighs) How can that be? We're relying on him to tell us the perfect answer. And he said, I don't know. And then, as if that weren't enough, he looked at the other panelists and he said, what do you people think? (laughs) Wow. Yeah? He's the expert of the experts, and he asked them for their opinions. Wow. Yeah? So that tells you a lot about the kind of person he was, is, yeah. He didn't, somebody, you know, somebody asks a question. Maybe he doesn't, let's say he doesn't know the answer. He doesn't say, well, what kind of question is that? (laughs) You know, in other words, tell the person who asked the question, it was a dumb question. Yeah, uh, I'm an expert. I'm not going to answer a dumb question. Yeah. Who are you asking me that question? Yeah, you are asking me that question. Yeah. Or you change the subject. Yeah, when you don't know the answer, what do we do? We change the subject. Yeah. Yeah. So we do anything but say, I don't know, in front of a group of people. Yeah. Because talk about an object of attachment, our reputation. Our reputation is one of our most precious, precious objects of attachment. What other people think of me. Yeah. I live and die for what other people think of me. What are other people's opinions of you? What is somebody's opinion of you? Yeah. It's a thought in their mind. Can you see the thought? Is it material in nature? How long does that thought in somebody else's mind last? Like that. So why am I so attached to those thoughts that are gone like this in somebody else's mind? Why do I care so much what other people think of me? That I'm always going around trying to impress people. Okay, this is a good question, isn't it? Yeah, because we spend a lot of time cultivating our reputation. Cultivating wisdom, manana in la manana. I'll do it <laughs> tomorrow morning. Yeah, but cultivate my my reputation. Mm-hmm. 
I always have time to do that. Yeah? Even when I'm lying in bed before I go to sleep, I think of what I'm going to look like after I impress all these people so that they think that the phony baloney facade I have is who I really am. It's crazy, isn't it? Isn't that craziness? Wanting to create some facade, pretending to be who we aren't, so that we get one blip of energy in somebody else's mind. Yeah. That's stupidity, isn't it? Yeah. But then we go, okay, okay. Well, it's one blip. How about a series of blips? Um, you know, their thought about me and my wonderful qualities. And how about if that thought opens their mouth and they say, oh, look at this person. So talented, so rich, so intelligent, and good looking too. Ooh. Yeah? So this person broadcasts all these false things about me so that everybody thinks that I am the facade that I pretend to be. Yeah? Until they get to know me. And then cracks appear. Cracks appear. Yeah, I created this image. I'm on TV. They write articles about me in the news. But somebody who really gets to know me, what do they see? Somebody who doesn't have self-confidence, somebody who's arrogant, somebody who only cares for themselves, is narcissistic, yeah? somebody who lies to co cover up their faults. <clears throat> huh? People will see who we really are. And then our reputation, ugh. yeah. But in our mind, yeah, even though with one person, maybe they saw through it and our reputation is ruined with that one person, but we still are hanging on to when I die, they, somebody will write this fantastic obituary about me. Yeah, this beautiful one with poetic, beautiful phrases praising me, yeah? And it'll be in, you know, the, the major newspapers around the world, my obit, yeah? And they'll televise my funeral. And the whole world will go, oh, she was so wonderful. What a loss for our world. <laughs> and we dream about our obituary and how much, how wonderful our reputation will be and everybody knows it. The only problem with being attached to our reputation in an obituary is that we're not going to be here to delight in all the fame we get. Yeah? Because we'll be born, reborn in some other realm, experiencing the result of our karma. Yeah? So we can't even enjoy the fame that we get finally after we die, when everybody has to say something nice about us. Yeah. Have you ever noticed 
You know, when somebody dies, you have to say something nice, even you don't like them. <laughs> even they're full of faults, you have to say something nice. Yeah? And then after a couple of days, then you can tell the truth. <laughs> We human beings are too much, aren't we? Yeah? We're so fake. We're so fake. Yeah? At least, you know, dogs and cats, you know what they're, where they're at and, and what they feel. Yeah? You know. If your dog's happy, you know your dog's happy. If your dog's unhappy, you know. Yeah. You know. Maybe, maybe your dog. Well, no, I think when they're hungry and they want you to feed them, okay. You know, they'll shake shake paws with you. Okay, so they'll do what you want to impress you, so that you give them a treat. Yeah, cats will not do that. Yeah. Yeah, cats, you really know where they're at. Uh, dogs will kind of, you know, do something to get the treat. We have cats at our monastery. Oh, don't get me talking about our cats. Oh, yes. It's almost time to stop. Anyway, you wanted to hear about our cats. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's a monastery. We practice non-attachment, except for our pets. Yeah, our cats are wonderful until they fight. But... You know, our cats, we have four cats, yeah? What are their names? Maitri, Karuna, Mudita, Upeka. <laughs> yeah? You recognize that? Yeah. So, they're the, they're the four Brahma Viharas. <coughs> so, we just have to get them to act according to their names. <laughs> yeah? Maitri does a good a good job of being very lovely, loving and friendly, unless she's around the other three. <laughs> then she doesn't get along with them. But otherwise, she's quite loving. Yeah. Karuna? Karuna? Karuna's nice. I don't know compassionate. Yeah, she's compassionate. Yeah, what does she do? Oh, when you're sad, she knows she'll come and sit on your lap. Corona? Yeah. Not on my lap. <laughs> 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 when she's sick or sad, she'll, she'll come look for me. She'll come, yeah? yeah? And I'm not like a popular cat person. So. Okay. Upeka? No, no, we have Mudita first. Mudita? No, she needs some. She's made a lot of progress. When she first showed up at our doorstep, a stray cat, she was angry at the world. And she's now much more mellow. So change is possible. Okay? Yeah. She's much more mellow. Rejoicing in others' virtues? Mm, she has some work to do on that. Okay, Upeka. Upeka's the only boy. Yeah? And Upeka is, does not have equanimity. Yeah? He, his favorite person is our office manager. Yeah? And he sits in her lap, and she sits in his lap. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a mutual love story between the office manager and Upeka the cat. 
Yeah. Okay. So maybe we should have some questions <laughs> and maybe answers now. Yeah, you want to hear about our cougar? <laughs> yeah, we can tell you about the turkeys. Oh my goodness, let me tell you about the turkeys. <laughs> okay. So, we, you know, our monastery is out in the middle of nowhere. It's in the forest, it's in the meadows, you know. Uh, yeah, we're in the middle of nowhere. So, there's turkeys, wild turkeys, yeah. Oh, Thanksgiving is today in America. Oh, my goodness. All the turkeys, we should do prayers for them. Yeah. Because turkey is what you're supposed to eat on Thanksgiving. Yeah. If you're a vegetarian, you roast some lettuce instead. And eat that. <laughs> so, so the, the turkey, the turkeys, you really understand where the expression bird brain comes from. Do you have that expression? When somebody's not so intelligent, their bird brain. Yeah. So turkeys, you know, they, they didn't get endowed with, gro with great intelligence. We have a, a garden, you know, with a fence around the garden so that the deer don't come in and, and eat everything. The turkeys will fly over the fence, okay, and land in the garden, and then, you know, start pecking at the grass and everything like that. And when they want to get out of the garden, they don't know how to get out. <laughs> yeah. So we have the fence, we have gates in the fence, even you open the gate of the fence, the turkeys will go up to the edge of the gate and then turn around and go back. They cannot figure out that you, they can go out the gate, which is what they want to do. You know, they, really, I'm, I'm not, you've seen it, yeah? They're, they're hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> they, okay, then, yeah, springtime, oh my goodness, springtime is mating season. So in, in your secondary schools, do you have, we, we have something called a prom. It's like a big dance where everybody gets dressed up and in really nice clothes and, you know, you pretend to be an adult even though you're 14. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so all the turkeys are out there and they're trying to figure out who goes to the prom with who. <laughs> yeah, who's going to mate with who. So, the boy turkeys they have some ego problem. <laughs> they think they're peacocks. <laughs> yeah? Peacocks have beautiful feathers. Yeah? They have open their feathers. They're beautiful. Turkeys spread their feathers. <laughs> they're turkeys. What do you expect? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not beautiful like peacocks. And plus, oh, the boy turkeys, I mean, this is the boy turkeys who do this. The girl turkeys ignore the boys. It's really like secondary school, you know? Yeah, the boys are all, you know, the boy turkeys, they have this red thing that comes here off their chin, and they have a blue one. Where's the blue one come off of? Somewhere in their face. And, I mean, they're so ugly, but, the, the, but they're trying to, trying to impress all the girl turkeys walking around with their feathers like this and their blue thing, their red thing, you know, like this. And then they'll fight, you know, they'll fight with each other. And the boy turkeys go, really, they go crazy you know, and pecking at each other and with their wings like this and, you know, 
And then, you know, okay, so they fight. Then they want to look good again for the girl turkeys. So we have on the back of our meditation hall, we have a, a, a window, a large window. So the boy turkeys go up to, to the wind. To, well, it's a, it's a um, sliding glass door, not a window. So full length. So the boy turkeys go up. They can see their reflection in the wind, in, in the, uh, yeah, in the glass. And they look. And then they start pecking at the glass. <laughs> peck, 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 peck. And you're in the hall trying to meditate. <laughs> and they're peck, 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 peck. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. And then they, then I guess they finally, well, they come pretty close to figuring out who's going to the prom with who. You know, but meanwhile, the girls basically ignore them. Yeah, the boys are like fluttering around with the girls, and the girls are just there pecking for their food. And you know, who are these? These guys are turkeys. <laughs> and they just completely ignore them. Anyway, after a while, you know, they kind of do their business. Yeah, we have a rule at the Abbey, you know, everybody's supposed to be celibate, but the, the turkeys, you know, kind of fudge on that one. And, uh, yeah, so, the, and so once they mate, then, yeah, the boy turkeys are, are their, um, what do you call them? Uh, the dads that, that don't stay Deadbeat dads, yeah. The boy turkeys are deadbeat dads, yeah. The girl turkeys are pregnant. They go out into the forest. They lay their eggs. They sit on the eggs. Boy turkey, deadbeat dad. He's off somewhere else, huh? You know, I don't know. Maybe he went to Florida. <laughs> to, to be with Ron Santos. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, you guys don't know American politics, <laughs> which or maybe you do, but American politics are crazy. Yeah, so anyway, yeah, and so then the girl turkeys are out there. They're very good mamas, yeah? They read the Good Housekeeping magazine. They, they, they know how to be good mothers. So they sit on their eggs, and the eggs hatch, and then Usually in June, late June, sometimes early to hot, then we see all these really cute little chicks, yeah, that come running out. And mama turkeys really have, you know, some of them, they'll have like 10 or 11 little, little creatures, you know? And what mama turkey has to do to keep all her turkeys, her little kids together, Oh my goodness, you know, because George goes that direction and Ethel goes here and, you know, Jason's running over there and Matilda's going somewhere else and Mama Turkey wants to guide all of her kids somewhere, you know, and so most of them will come but a few of them are kind of rebellious, just like we were, you know, when we, when we got to be teenagers. So, yeah, so what I'm getting at, you know, I'm not just telling you funny stories. It's like, this is how human beings are. Yeah, this is how human beings act. The turkeys are wonderful examples of how human beings act. Yeah, and, it, you know, and everything you see you know, when you study human beings, is a dharma, a dharma teaching. Yeah, if you, you can read a newspaper and it becomes an incredible dharma teaching. Yeah, very often about karma, or about attachment, or about anger. Yeah, Incre you know, you just sit and watch 
and there's everything the Buddha taught right in front of your nose. You can see it everywhere except in yourself. That's, that's our problem. Yeah, we can see how everybody else is in samsara. But us, no. Our problem isn't that we're in samsara. Our problem is that the rest of the world doesn't realize that we are the center of the universe. <laughs> yeah? That's our problem. If the world only realized that, everything would be okay. Yeah? But they don't. <sighs> okay, let's try some questions and comments and maybe answers. Thank you very much for that powerful sharing, Venerable Tipton Children. Now we would like to open the floor for Q&A. So um, I will be bringing the mic to you if you have any questions. And I, uh, Pravin, you have a question? Thank you. Uh, hello, Venerable. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes, uh, hello, Venerable. Um, your talk was super lovely. Um, your talk previously, which I attended, was just as lovely, so I'm happy to see you again. Um, one takeaway that I took from this conversation was that um, you've got an incredible sense of humor. And it made me super curious. Um, what do you think it is psychologically about humor that allows us to feel at ease in life? And how do you think we can apply humor in our day to day life to feel happier and more comfortable? I think humor is really important, especially being able to laugh at ourselves. Yeah, and one of my teachers, he was so skillful at getting us to laugh at ourselves. He would point out our mistakes and our bad qualities, all the things you don't want other people to know about you, <laughs> that you don't want to even acknowledge to yourself. And he would point them out and then make get us to laugh about that quality. Yeah, he had a remarkable talent to do that. And it made me realize how important it is to be able to laugh at myself. Yeah, and not take myself so seriously. Not feel like I have to be this image. I'm a nun. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your red packet? <laughs> you don't have a red packet <laughs> that you're going to give to me? <laughs> Sorry, I'm busy tonight. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah? Just to be able to laugh at ourselves. And it, it brings forth a comfort, an openness, a transparency to just not be ashamed of our faults, not try and hide things, just to, yeah, I have that, I have that fault. The world knows it. Why am I trying to cover it up? Yeah, I can laugh at it. I can joke about it. Okay? And so I think being able to laugh at ourselves is very important if you're going to practice the Dharma for a long time. Because if you take yourself so seriously all the time, you are going to be miserable. Mm -hmm. And when you're miserable, then you know, bye-bye Dharma. <laughs> Let me give you one example. You know, uh, I was at a conference, or a, a gathering, I should say, of Sangha from different traditions in the U.S. And this one uh, young monk in the Theravada tradition, uh, he 
said to me at one point, he said, can I talk to you? And I said, okay. So we sat down and we talked. And he said to me, you know, he said, I'm a new monk. You know, haven't been very ordained, ordained very well. I really want to be a good monk. I really am trying so hard. But whenever I think of the Buddha looking at me, I see the Buddha frowning and scolding me <laughs> and saying, you're, you know, you're not keeping your precepts very well. What kind of monk are you? And he said that to me, and he was serious. And I thought, oh my goodness, this person has intense suffering. You know, if you think that what the Buddha is going to do, you know, when the Buddha sees you, it scolds you, who are you going to take, what's your refuge? Who, who are you going to take refuge in? Yeah, what path are you going to follow if you think like that? So I talked, you know, I talked to him a long time about, you know, about low self-esteem and that kind of stuff. But I really emphasized how important it is to laugh at yourself and not take yourself so seriously. Yeah? And then, it's interesting, this happened many years ago. Then this year, he and another monk came to visit our monastery. And he was still in robes, and he was much happier. Yeah? It was, it was good to see. Thank you very much for that. Uh, your clarification, that was very powerful as well. Do we have another question from the floor? Then you may raise your hands and I'll... Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes, uh, good evening, Venerable Tutan children. Yeah, thank you for the Dhamma sharing. One of the, one of the ways you were sharing in handling clinging attachment clinging attachment, you said, play this movie in your head, uh, how your car might get scratched and so on. My question is concerning the, the potential harm of that, that method, because I know a few people who are very skilled at playing the movie in their head, all the ways things could, could go wrong. Yeah, they, they, could, they could imagine a lot of ways how things could turn out to be terrible and bad, and that might cause a lot of worry, a lot of agitation. And so I, I'm wondering how... Um, how we could, I guess, use this method more skillfully, um, whether there are, there are certain situations or circumstances we could, we could use it, or whether there are some where we might want to avoid it, I'm not sure. And uh, to add on to that question, sometimes is it really very helpful to sort of picture or play the movie how things could go wrong? I mean, if we're going for an exam, we might want to picture ourselves, you know, Doing well. Uh, if, if we start a business, for example, we want to we want to aim or hope for success and, and profit, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. Okay. So I'm I was using that, yeah, as a way to counteract attachment. Yeah. So if you see the, you you know, <coughs> you, you imagine having everything, and then you imagine it going wrong, yeah. So that's the kind of situation in which you would do that to bring your mind to a more balanced, realistic state. I did not, I do not encourage meditating on everything that can go wrong <laughs> if, if you're prone to anxiety and fear and worry. Because then it's not an antidote to what you're feeling. It is what you're feeling, okay? So when you apply antidotes, you have to apply them to, at the proper time and to the particular affliction, okay? Yeah. So when you're angry, yeah, you might want to think of somebody's good qualities. That's not the time to think of, you know, their faults. When you're over the, over the head over heels in attachment, 
that's the time to think about the pulse. So you have to really know what you're doing and what is an antidote to what. Okay, does that help? Yes, it's very helpful, thank you. Okay. Yeah, and if you are prone to anxiety and worry and fear, okay, the, uh, here's the antidote for that mental state, okay? What you do is, yeah, especially everything that can go wrong, all your faults, all this stuff, you know, that you go over and over and over again in your mind. Yeah, write them down. This is your self-talk, you know, because sometimes our self-talk is poison. You know, I can't do anything right, nobody loves me, yeah, everything I do, everything I make breaks. Yeah, Every, you know, look, when you talk to yourself, yeah, what, what kind of thoughts do you think about yourself? Very often, this kind of stuff, yeah. So if you're prone to thinking like that, then the antidote is, you know, write it down, take down one of them, take one of them. You know, one of them is usually, I can't do anything right. Then you ask yourself, is that true? Is that true that I can't do anything right? Because I keep saying it to myself, oh, I'm such a failure, I can't do anything right. Is that true? Yeah? Is it true you can't do anything right? Yeah, you brushed your teeth. Yeah. You got dressed in the morning. You're potty trained. Yeah. You drove your car, or got on the bus, or whatever, to get here. You went to work. You do a lot of things right. You don't have to be perfect, but if, you, you know, all the things we tell ourselves that are so negative, yeah, I'm so ugly, oh, oh, I'm so ugly, you look in the mirror, yeah, and there are all these gray hairs and wrinkles, and then what my dermatologist calls barnacles. <laughs> They're all over your face, all over your body, these things that grow on you. Yeah. And then you remember this Dharma teaching you had like five decades ago when your teacher said, yeah, you're very attached to your appearance now, but if you were to look in the mirror and see what you're going, what you look like in 50 years from now, you would fall over. <laughs> and then, there it is. Yeah, you're looking in the mirror, and you look, you're 50 years older than when your teacher said that, and it's like, wait a minute, that's not me, you know, but it is me, it is me. Okay, so I'm ugly, that's okay, yeah? If people don't like me because I don't look like Melania Trump, <laughs> actually, I don't think she's very pretty. <laughs> Anyway, enough about her. Yeah, I have compassion for that lady. <laughs> yeah. You think your husband has problems. Yeah. Okay. But you think, okay, I'm ugly. I can accept that. Yeah, I walk down the street. If people stare at me now, it's not because I'm beautiful. It's because they don't know who in the world I am and what planet I came from, you know, because who looks like me besides those three? <laughs> and when they see a few of us walking down the street, it's like, 
Mars? Jupiter? <laughs> what, what does your spaceship look like? <laughs> but, you know, at some point, you say in your life, if people only like me because of how I look, then I don't have very good friends. Yeah? And I don't really want people to like me because of, of my appearance. I want, or at least my external beauty. Yeah. I want people to look inside and see internal beauty. So what I want to spend my day doing is not this. <laughs> yeah. But this. Because this is how you create internal beauty. So you, you know, you learn to much more self-acceptance, hopefully. If you're still attached, yeah, then, you know, then what do you do? Then you go and you get Botox, yeah, so mm, stretch everything out, yeah. So you get Botox and then some, you know, you go to the dermatologist and then they fry all your barnacles off and so for a week or two you look really weird <laughs> yeah so I mean what's the choice you either accept yourself or you're miserable yeah and you really see that friends that people that like you because you look good yeah they're not going to be friends for long because we're all getting older and uglier and that's the reality of it, isn't it? Are you getting older and more attractive? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Venerable. I think we have two more questions from the floor. So we'll start with system show. Okay, I'll try and keep it short because it's getting late. Oh, it's 9.30. Good evening, Venerable. Oh, yes. um, this is not really a question, but more of a request. I attended your talk where you were a panelist, and there was a question from the floor, which I forgot what it was, but you, um, you gave the answer about how we could start the day um, uh, having no, wanting no harm to all beings and so on. I, I really like the phrase, but yeah. I just thought it was so beautiful, but I can't remember the whole thing, uh -huh. so... Is this a request if you can oh, repeat I'll, that? Yeah, I'll tell Thank you. you. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad that somebody got something out of that. So, <clears throat> the best, a really good way to practice the Dharma is when you first wake up in the morning to cultivate your motivation. Yeah. And what is the most important thing that you have to do? every single day of your life. Yeah? I think when I wake up, the most important thing I have to do is not run here and there and this and that. It's don't harm anybody. Whatever I do that day, most important, don't harm anybody. Yeah? Another very important thing to do every day, benefit others. Again, in whatever small or large way I can. So before you even get out of bed in the morning, you know, generate that motivation. Today, as much as possible, I will not harm others physically, verbally, or even mentally thinking bad thoughts about them. And today, as much as possible, I will be a benefit to others. Yeah. It doesn't have to be some extraordinary thing that everybody notices. It could be passing the salt or, you know, giving somebody a cup of water. So you set that intention in the day and it really makes a difference. Thank you very much, Venerable, for answering our questions. And. Um, yeah, I'd just like to recap as well that uh, instead of focusing, learning from what Venerable has shared today, instead of focusing on cultivating things of this world, um, such as our reputation and relationships that are fueled by unrealistic projections, 
um, let us re-optimize our precious human moments to cultivate our minds, uh, as that is what we can truly inherit from this life throughout our lifetimes. And that is the essence of true inner beauty as well. Yeah, and uh, let us strive to gradually disconnect from attachment, aversion, and ignorance, and connect more with our beautiful qualities like generosity, kindness, and wisdom through mindfulness and clear awareness. With that, uh, we would like to invite Venerable to lead us in sharing of merits. Okay. So, we, we do uh, almost as many of our prayers as we can uh, in English. Yeah, so that we understand, this is our monastery, so that we understand what we're saying. Okay. Due to this merit, may we soon attain the awakened state of Guru Buddha, that we may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their sufferings. May the precious body mind not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. Okay. Thank you very much once again, Venerable. Venerable Dutton Children and uh, Venerable Dham for leading the Puja and Sharing of Merits. Now let us all rise and give three bows out of gratitude and respect for Venerable Dutton Children to bow for the first time. Second bow. Third bow. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, so study and practice the Dharma well. <laughs>